History Month to me is an important, important time of year. I've been a resident of Canmore for 23 years. Um, it gives me a chance to reflect on the accomplishments that my ancestors and people have made to our country and our community. Um, it helps me to reach out to others within the community to teach and help them understand um, that this is part of all of our history and how we can all work together to make it even a better future. Um, it celebrates our, our accomplishments, not only in Canada, but in North America, United States and around the world. It's, it's just a great, a great time of year for me. Good morning. When we gather in the name of Christ, we are reminded that Christ is with us. Whether in person or online, in the sanctuary or in God's wondrous creation, when we pause to ponder the gift of holy love, we are embraced and inspired by the Christ who is within, between and beyond us. In this time of worship, we invite and celebrate the light of Jesus as we welcome the Christ candle into our midst. May the light of Christ bring illumination and clarity to the path ahead. Amen. Welcome everyone to this service of worship. Please join with me in a prayer of gratitude. We gather to worship on this day, O oh God, filled with gratitude for the world in all its beauty. From many different locations, our hearts join in this time of honest self-assessment and preparation for faithful discipleship. We bring you the deepest and most personal prayers of our hearts, O God, naming in prayer those known to us who need healing or guidance or reassurance of your presence. We listen for your heartfelt concerns, loving God, as you encourage us to expand our circle of care, to see the needs of our neighbors, local and global. We pray for all who feel marginalized within the community or alienated from your church. As Pink Shirt Day approaches, we particularly pray for any and all who have experienced bullying and as affirming congregations, we reaffirm our commitment to be safe and loving communities for members of the LGBTQ community. We open ourselves prayerfully to the urgings of your Holy Spirit. We name to you our thankfulness for those who have tended this land for millennia and for the opportunity to seek deeper relationship with our hosts on this land, the Iyarhe Nakoda people of the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley Nations, the people of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Takani, and Kainai, the Sutina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta Region 3. In love, we bring all these prayers to you, Creator God, and add to them the prayer of Jesus as we say, Our Mother and Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In this, our second Sunday in Black History Month, we turn our attention to the Underground Railroad. A week ago Thursday, a number of Ralph Connor folk attended an online Zoom presentation by Cheryl Fogo and her daughter, Miranda Martini. 
where we learned so much about the spiritual hymns that are so closely connected to the Underground Railroad, and a number of those songs are included in today's service. In the days when slavery was prevalent in North America, slaves were generally pre prevented from learning to read or write. The one slight exception in some circumstances was the Bible. In general, a slave could speak those words about Jesus and Moses, about hopes of heaven, without much fear of repercussion. That being the case, these same words of faith could be developed into a code that could be safely spoken, that could help escaped slaves locate safe houses, to know the timing of um, meetings where travel plans would be finalized, orient themselves to a proven escape route. Key words like promised land or crossing over or even references to shoes or footwear of any sort since these typically were not possessions held by slaves. Today we share these songs in a spirit of honoring the people who originally sang them and the role these songs played in the path to freedom. For a long time, I was absolutely clueless about the details of the Underground Railroad. Was it an actual railroad? Underground? Well, in what way? Where did it go? Where from? Where to? Now, I knew that my birthplace, Owen Sound, Ontario, had a historical display that commemorated its role in the Underground Railroad, but beyond that, I knew little. Gradually, I have learned quite a bit more, but still needed a bit of assistance and found it in the Canadian Encyclopedia, uh, whose words I largely quote here. The Underground Railroad was a secret organization made up of people who helped African Americans escape from the slavery in the southern United States. The people in this organization set up a system of routes that escaped slaves could travel to find freedom in the northern United States and in Canada. 
in the 1800s between 30,000 and 40,000 escaped slaves traveled to the northern states and to what was at that time British North America or Canada through the Underground Railroad. The abolitionist movement, which was committed to abolishing slavery, was pivotal in establishing this system. And this movement included white Christians, indigenous peoples, and former slaves. Abolitionists and escaped slaves used many words associated with the railroad to describe their escape routes, which is why these activities and the road to freedom took on the name Underground Railroad. For example, people who helped the escaping slaves in their journey north were called conductors. The words cargo, package, and freight were used to describe the escapees. The words stations and depots referred to safe houses where escaped slaves would stay for a brief time. Ticket agents planned the trips that escaped slaves took north. They also helped these people to contact station masters and conductors. The routes taken by these travelers were called lines. The lines ended in the 14 northern states and upper and lower Canada, and each end of a line was called a terminus. Most of the people who traveled these lines settled in Upper Canada, or Ontario. They farmed, they founded businesses, they created many religious, cultural, political, and community organizations. The first African-Canadian settlers faced much prejudice and racism. Many Canadians would not hire them. They were often not allowed to live in the places they wanted to live. African-Canadian children were often not permitted to attend the same schools as European Canadians. European Canadian parents did not want their children educated in the same schools as African-Canadian children. And in some cases, this prejudice has remained strong even to this day. In those early days, many African-Canadians fought against the prejudice they faced. They founded their own schools and struggled for the right of equal access to education. They also struggled to win the right to live where they wanted to live and obtain good jobs. This fight continued throughout the 20th century and still into the 21st. It has not been easy. In the search for freedom, early black settlers in Canada have worked hard to make a better life, life for themselves their families, and their fellow citizens.
I am standing in front of the sign that directs you to the, to the Buxton National Historic Site and Museum in North Buxton, Ontario, Canada. Uh, where we are now, it was a, a haven for fugitive slaves, founded by a gentleman by the name of Reverend William King, who was a white Presbyterian minister that was born in Londonderry, Ireland in 1812. Uh, and through a variety of circumstances, he acquired 15 slaves, uh, opposed to slavery, and couldn't free them in the South. So he wanted somewhere where he could free not his own uh, not only his own fugitives but he wanted somewhere where other free blacks could come as well because he had a firm belief that if blacks were given an opportunity they could um, have uh, economic ind independence um, and they could become very self-sufficient and self-sustaining so he sought the assistance of the Presbyterian Church and an association called the Elgin Association that was comprised of um, shareholders, both black and white. Uh, basically, they pooled their resources together and they acquired 9,000 acres here in Raleigh Township for uh, fugitive slaves and free blacks could come and settle. Now, Reverend King, um, once the fugitives arrived here, he provided them with, with uh, each received 50 acres. Um, they were had to pay two dollars and fifty cents for each for an acre but there were restrictions that were set down uh, by Reverend King for the settlement um, the houses had to be 33 feet back from the road they had to be 18 by 24 no fewer than four rooms you had to have a flower garden a vegetable garden and I think it was these rules and reg uh, restrictions that he enforced that it um, uh, provided a, a, a sense of pride in the settlers here uh, and you could see how their self-esteem was just uh, really really uh, improved because once they arrived they owned something uh, because in the south they didn't own anything they had no they didn't own the clothes on their back but once they arrived here they had something that they could call their own so today we have the museum uh, which holds the numerous artifacts uh, from the settlement and a schoolhouse that was built in 1861 by some of those former fugitive slaves, uh, a church that was built in 1866, a train station that dates back to 1870, and another church that's 1883. I think Buxton is probably one of the only uh, f remaining black Canadian settlements that's still existing as a very self-sufficient, uh, cohesive community uh, since the pre-Civil War era. But at its peak, there were close to 2,000 people that lived in Buxton and the surrounding area. Today, the population is probably close to 100, but we're still a very, um, very cohesive community. But I say to you that listen, Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer them the other also. And from anyone who takes your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes your goods, don't ask for them again. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If, if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those who you hope to receive from, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Then, your reward is great. You will be children of the Most High, for he's kind. He's kind to the ungrateful and, and to the wicked. Be merciful, as your Father is merciful. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. 
Do not condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. For a good measure, press down and shaken together and running over will be put into your lap. And the measure that you give is the measure that you will get back. I find myself in the middle of a dilemma this morning. On the one hand, this section from the Gospel of Luke holds core teachings of how we are to live in community with one another in this world. These are such familiar words and they tumble one after another. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. If someone takes your coat, give them your shirt as well. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Judge not, lest you be judged. And perhaps my favorite, and a little less familiar than some of the others, the measure you use for others is the one that will be used for you. I want these words to speak to us today. And so I ask, what are the implications of these guiding statements? on the way that you and I conduct ourselves in this world. What prejudices or judgments need to be let go of? Who do we regard as enemies? Where do I give myself more leeway than I give to others? Now, to an extent, we recognize that Jesus is using hyperbole here, exaggerating just how generous one is to be with others but he exaggerates only to an extent. Jesus proposes and has, in fact, initiated a whole new way of being founded on doing everything possible to be connected to one another in a healthy and integrated way. These words speak with such clarity. That being the case, what's the other thing I'm worried about? Where is the dilemma? Well, the dilemma is that if heard the wrong way, these words from Scripture can give us the impression that Jesus is pulling us back from saying hard things that need to be said. That Jesus is pulling us back from um, naming oppression or from resisting aggression. As we hear his sage and necessary advice that we are to govern our assessment of others using the same amount of leeway that we give ourselves, does this then remove our ability to speak out, to raise objections about the words and actions of others, if we are to allow and even invite mistreatment by turning the other cheek? Does this mandate that those who are abused should just continue to be abused? So you see, if viewed from a certain angle, these radical words by Jesus on how community is to be shaped in the kingdom of God may seem to suggest that the way to achieve peace is to just smooth the waters wherever possible, to not make a fuss, not, not rock the boat. But that's not what we're being asked to do, and I think we know that. We are called into relationships where we are accountable to one another. An accountability that is anchored in love and honesty. In order to illustrate how this might work, I think back to my previous place of employment. And the setting for this is just under 20 years ago. At that time, the school I worked at did an international teacher exchange which netted us a breezy, plain-spoken middle grades teacher from Australia. She was fun, loud, outgoing, and she knew her students well. It didn't take long for her to figure out which of her students were really giving maximum effort, which ones were coasting, 
and all of the varying degrees in between. Now, she had endless time for those who were trying hard and just not getting something. And for those who understood right away and were eager to go further or deeper with that concept. But there were rather blunt pronouncements for those who were slacking. A particular favorite of hers was to look at an already marked essay and then look at the student and then ask the withering question, would you call this the best effort you could have made on this? That was a question you had space to answer. If it was the best you could do, because she didn't understand something or there was some other barrier, you could make a plan with her to firm up those concepts. But if it wasn't your best, and you knew it wasn't, you would get the essay handed back to you with the opportunity to boost your mark with a do-over. And I can say that one was well advised to put maximum effort into that second attempt. As I recall it, a key element to this teacher's demeanor made her classroom work. And that is, she was fully prepared to come into the office where I worked at the end of the day and say out loud, well, that wasn't my best teaching ever. And she wasn't above confessing that to the class the next day. And if they really hadn't got something or if, if she hadn't imparted what she needed to, there could be a redo of some of the teaching of that lesson. And no, she wasn't perfect in her classroom practices because yes, she did have one or two students in particular with whom she locked horns on a regular, almost daily basis. But in that classroom, I saw the same measure being used for herself as for the students. They were still learning she was still learning. The students were expected to give it the old college try and their teacher expected no less than that of herself. In that classroom, in that community, there was brutal honesty. Sometimes I think a bit too much in your face. But when something was spotted, it was named rather than being, than being swept under the carpet. And if something needed to be said that was potentially going to be embarrassed, uh, embarrassing for a student, the exchange typically would happen out in the hall rather than in front of one's peers. Things that needed to change were addressed. Room to effect that change was created. Support during the change was available. And past mistakes didn't have a lot of carryover. There was, however, some kind of positive motion expected. Now I can say with absolute certainty that this particular teacher would find it hilarious to think that this was being used as an extended sermon illustration, but the point remains. Jesus names to us a certain quality of community that is based in truth-telling. This truth-telling begins with an honest assessment of my actions and my motives, but it doesn't end there or get stalled there. The truth-telling mandated and empowered by Jesus calls us to pay attention to what's going on around us and to name injustice whenever or wherever it is evident. We are called to be astute to sharpen our sense of who's getting hurt and who is benefiting. We are called to discernment, to learn the difference between someone who is in good faith offering a different opinion or perspective from mine, or to hear someone who has been shaped by trauma. And to be able to separate those things from someone who is intentionally bending or breaking the truth for their own benefit or to feed an agenda of hatred. The realm that Christ Jesus came to initiate is filled with peace and justice. But in order to be there, there's going to be 
some big time disruption of the way we interact with one another. Over a year ago, continuing an emphasis that has been ongoing for many decades, the United Church of Canada named racism for the pernicious evil that it is, challenging us to recognize and name the actions and impacts of the racism that exists beyond us and between us and within us. And while racism is the main sin being named, our truth-telling beyond and between and within is not to be limited to that one thing. Any number of other isms or phobias also diminish the kind of community Christ calls us to, and they need to be named for what they are. If it demeans or excludes, and especially if it demeans or excludes to the benefit of those who are already sitting pretty on top of the social pyramid, it needs to be addressed. And no venue is to escape criticism. It's not just the world out there that gets surveyed. It's also the ways that racism expresses itself in my life, in my family and my neighborhood in my church. For a long time now, there has been a rising tide of hatred and hate speech in this land. If we were to imagine that the aggressive, outrageous fringe groups who have taken the opportunity for a higher profile by tagging along with the blockades in Ottawa or Coots or Windsor and elsewhere, if we were to imagine that they just appeared out of nowhere, we would be deeply mistaken. There is a problem here. And the anti-racism common table of the United Church has, I think, named it well. They write, We are concerned that these demonstrations have become places of hate and oppression. We do not support the use of symbols of hate such as swastikas and the Confederate flag, the appropriation of indigenous cultures, ceremony, and symbols such as the Every Child Matters flag, and the use of racist, ableist, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, misogynist, homophobic, transphobic, and anti-immigrant language and threats. We have seen this not just at the protests themselves, but also in social media in support of them. Our commitment to becoming an anti-racist, intercultural and reconciling church requires that we name this clearly. There is within their words a specific call to the church, and they continue. If you are within the United Church community, we challenge you to discern how, as a disciple of Christ, you are called to respond. Please use your voice against racism whenever and wherever you can with calmness and faithful persistence with the goal of making the racism and discrimination in these protests or wherever unequivocally. Friends, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called to express his bold, courageous, reconciling love, to name hatred for what it is, and to speak truth to that. We are called to be communities where we are rigorously honest with ourselves and with one another, and from that foundation of integrity, speak up when hatred is having its way. And following the call of Christ to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, we are to have high expectations of ourselves and our society rather than making excuses for words and actions that are intentionally divisive and hurtful and rooted in bigotry. May the honesty that we hear so powerfully expressed in the words of Jesus be the ground upon which we stand 
in determining what we expect of ourselves and the society in which we live. Amen. This coming Wednesday, February 23rd, is Pink Shirt Day in Canada, a time to stand against bullying. In Chinook Winds region, a special Zoom session will be hosted by the Indigenous Ministries leaders starting at 7 o'clock p.m. The link to join this online event will be posted on the Ralph Connor website. Next Sunday, February 27th, Rundle Memorial United Church in Banff will hold its annual general meeting at 11 o'clock a.m. on Zoom. That will be following our usual online worship service. The link and the AGM report will be circulated by email. If you have not received these by midweek and are a member or adherent of Rundle, please contact me by email and we will get that attended. Please join with me in today's Prayers of the People, which today come to us from Rabbi Andrea Goldstein in St. Louis, Missouri. Source of all being, creator of all life, may your goodness find its way into the hearts of all your children. May those who wield power do so with a balance of wisdom, justice, and compassion. May those who feel powerless remember their intrinsic worth, and also act with the balance of wisdom, integrity, and compassion. May we all feel called to action based on the injustices of racism, and see ourselves not as enemies of one another, not in struggle against one another, but as human beings, created in the image of God, connected to one another's well-being. May all of us come to acknowledge the racism that is pervasive in our society and the hidden benefits that many of us derive. May we commit to sitting down with one another in honest dialogue, 
opening our, our hearts in compassion to one another, bearing witness to the pain and fear of one another, even if and especially if the other looks and seems so different from ourselves. May we commit to joining together in acts of justice that will bring about equality in education, economic opportunities, law enforcement, and judicial proceedings. May each of us come to understand that, ultimately, my experience of freedom, justice, and peace is inextricably linked to the freedom, justice, and peace of every other person in our community, our nation, and our world. May we open our eyes to the invisible lines of connection that unite us, and with clarity of vision continue to work for a world where every person's life is valued, cherished, and loved. Amen. Today's commissioning and benediction is by Alidia Smith. Although the road is long and the journey is hard, although the mountains are too high and the valleys are too low, by your grace, O oh God, give us hope. By your power, give us strength. By your mercy, give us wisdom, so that we may continue to go where you lead us until all your children are safe from harm. May we go from this time of worship with your light shining the way before us.